Hi there. Herman Scuttle. I haven't been around for a while, but I'm here now, and I have a lot to say, and I'm saying it. Now, today, a new day opens automatically. A new day is announced by the stir of street traffic in a morning rain. And I'm conscious. I can anticipate all of my needs. I'm still fit to chase a thrill. At the coffee shop, I order espresso. Let me say that again. At the coffee shop, I order espresso and they bring me instant Sanka. I should come back tonight and set the place on fire because I'm fit to chase a thrill. And I know that getting dirty is as much fun as getting clean. It's automatic. It's automatic like a new day. This one, cloudy and wet, but nice enough. Nice enough. Nice enough until the new wears off. Well, here's what happened last night. I, <laughs> I sat up in bed and I rolled my head to get rid of a headache, a headache in the middle of the night. And I was midway through a dream about making love to Helen Mirren. Let me say that again. I was midway through a dream about making love to Helen Mirren. Eat your heart out. Well, it was a MSG headache. And I got that from eating Hormel chili for supper. I ate it cold, right out of the can, with a plastic spoon. And that, of course, guaranteed the stab and sting of noggin abuse at 2 o'clock in the morning. Well, I groped for my radio, and I got the classical station. They were playing Mozart's Piano Concerto Number no. 13 in C major, played by Maria Joao Perez on the keys. And that should have been good enough. But it wasn't. I was this close to giving up and self-executing. I said, my kingdom for a guillotine. And if I was beheaded, I would cradle my head and hold it until the pain stopped. But the pain did stop. And I continued dreaming about Helen Mirren. And Helen said in my dream she wanted to make love. But I said, Helen, I can't. I have a headache. Okay, fine. But uh, look, it's good to see you. I mean it, it's good to see you. And uh, let me thank you for dropping by. Now this, uh, yeah, this here is known as an SRO, a single room occupancy. And oh yeah, I know that cute little nose of yours is a, about to sniff and shoot skyward because that social stratification voice inside you is saying, you shouldn't stick around here. And look at you, damn it, you wore your good clothes. You should have come in your sweatsuit. 
All right, look, relax. You'll have plenty of time when you get home to take a bath in Lysol and then run to the doctors and get a tetanus shot. Hmm? But look, we've got a, a, a nice little uh, community kitchen here. We all share things here, me and 12 other lodgers. Plenty of leftover mac and cheese in the fridge. Pop it right into the microwave. Hmm? <laughs> Look, just, just sit down and, and interview me. That's what you wanted, right? I mean, uh, you asked me for an interview after hearing me read my poetry the other night. You caught me reading my stuff over at the, uh, what's it called? The Trendoid Center. Yeah, and I was wearing the same sloppy outfit that I'm wearing now. But come on. If you're such a big wheel, the city's wonderful cultural maven, you might stay a while and appreciate the, the good culture we have in the rooms and the hallways of this SRO building. Hey, you want to slice a Wonder Bread with your mac and cheese? Uh, let's check the news. Let's check what's happening in the news. Hmm? Here we go. Um, two men, Raphael Breedy and Alex Schultz, walked 856 feet on a tightrope over a Melanesian volcano. In case they fell, both men had insurance policies to make sure they'd be covered. Also in the news, the world's largest cocktail was made at a bar in Thailand. The 167-gallon drink was mixed at the Clinton Tavern in Bangkok. And in a related story, author Harper Lee invented a cocktail and called it Tequila Mockingbird. And uh, finally in the news, a uh, Canadian news anchor named Farah Neeson swallowed a fly during her broadcast, but she bravely continued reporting. Later, Ms. Neeson was able to retrieve the fly for a souvenir, which she got by the process of elimination. Uh, now then, song? You want a song? Okay, okay. I did write a song just for you last night. Or maybe it was the night before I had the headache last night, right? Okay. The night before the headache, I wrote this song just for you. When I was a kamikaze, doing what kamikazes do. When I was a kamikaze, doing what kamikazes do. Well, you can bet your life I did it much better than you. And when I was a crocodile down in the Everglades. When I was a crocodile down in the Everglades, I was creepy and fierce with teeth like razor blades. And even I was a virus doing what a virus does. And the whole wide world got sicker than it ever was. But I'm a lover, not a fighter. Baby, give me one more chance. I'm a lover, not a fighter, honey. Give me one more chance. Come a little bit closer. All I want to do is dance. Of course. Of course. 
Don't tell me you liked it. I know you like it. Of course. Uh, now then, uh, just, uh, just stay where you are. Stay right where you are. Just sit there for a minute and let me say something and then I won't bother you anymore. I was really, really tired and ticked off the other night. I was having a bad day. I was in my, my nasty, short fuse state of mind. And yes, absolutely, my worst day is nothing compared to every day of your life. Okay, I know that. But look, I had no idea about anything about you, and I was no, no mood. I was in no mood that night to see somebody like you sleeping in the back seat of my car. Now, okay, if I forgot to lock the car, then it's my own damn fault. But being as spun out as I was from my bad day, I overreacted and I barked at you. I'm calling the cops, I said. Well, yes, down at police headquarters, when I found out who you were, I stopped the whole thing and got this, I got this room here for you at the Mercy Seat Motel, okay? Yeah. So uh, don't worry about any money or how long you can stay here. Lucas, the owner of this place, Lucas, yeah, he owes me a lot of favors. So you're perfectly safe. You can stay here as long as you want. Now, when we were at the police headquarters and they told me your name was Derek, hmm? I took a closer look at you. All of a sudden, I remembered this woman who named her daughter Derek after the Yankee shortstop. Yeah. And that woman turned out to be your mother, who I was very close to. And I, I know what happened to her, and I'm still sick about that. You know, if I was a better kind of a man, she wouldn't have had to push me out of her life, and maybe things uh, would have lasted between us. Her personal tragedies, after I was out of the picture, might have never been allowed to happen. Eh, maybe. Maybe not. But I should have bit the bullet. I should have bit the bullet. Gets me so aggravated I can barely say the words. But I should have bit the bullet. I wish I had more guts. I had the chance to be a good stepfather for you but I was weak. But now, this situation that we have here, it could be like a out of the blue chance for a, a second chance for me to help you, give you a helping hand from now on. Hmm? Of course, if that doesn't fit your, your logic of things, well then that's fine too. But give yourself a break, just for a few days. I've got you covered for all the expenses. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go here now, leave you to yourself. Here's my number. You can call me anytime you want. But remember, while we all fight our demons, Let's try not to become one of them.
letters. Yeah, I, I, this is the part I don't really like to do. I don't like to hear from people by mail or email or text or whatever you call it, but I've got a few correspondences here and I'll share them with you. Reluctantly, but I'll share them with you. Uh, here's uh, one from someone named Twitsy Birkenstock of Lee, Massachusetts. Uh, she says, are raccoons bad animals? No, no, no. Raccoons are okay. They actually follow current health protocols. They wash their food and they wear masks. Uh, Bella Palsy from Great Barrington says, uh, I'm thinking of taking up skydiving. Is it really that difficult? Well, I would say the hardest part of skydiving is the ground. Norm Van Touchdown of Sheffield says, uh, Herman, I need your advice. Not only have I never had a best friend, I've never even had a right-hand man. Uh-huh. Well, there still may be time for you to find a left-hand woman. Uh, we've got a, a letter here, correspondence from Kamala Apostrophe of Lennox. And she says, can a snake impregnate a rabbit? Or vice versa, can a rabbit impregnate a snake? <laughs> yeah, yeah, really. Uh, and uh, their babies turn out to be jump ropes. Here's the last one, and, and then I, I really don't like doing this, but uh, here's the last one. When someone says, and this is from uh, somebody named Mario Tablecloth from Housatonic, says, uh, when someone says there's a sucker born every minute, what does that mean? Well, it tells you that it takes 60 seconds to make one lollipop. I spent a few hours in the woods. You with me? Yeah. It's a good thing for you to do too. But I spent a few hours in the woods and it was about as good as it should be. I stuck to familiar trails right there at the bottom of Mount Greylock, moderate to fairly challenging trails, rocky and rooty, uh, acorns and fallen leaves on the path. Yes, that uh, Bud Light can right there in the middle of nowhere. Don't get me started. Uh, jittery chipmunks were there, and they were bothered by my business. Crows telegraphing their excitement with my orange shirt and my yellow hat. Some flies and gnats at my earlobes. But it was wild and wonderful as expected few hours hiking in the woods. As good as it should be. Autumn in the Berkshires. But the brooks weren't babbling. There was scarcely any movement of water. None of the usual gurgling flow snaking down the ravines from up in the heights. This is Mount Greylock Woods I'm in. Uh, yes, I know, I know, we, we, we had a drought this year, alarmingly dry, dog days of dehydration. And there in the woods, I'm, I'm observing this, and uh, I, I said, hey, uh, somebody's got to do something. So, I found a clearing about two miles, uh, two miles. You see, when I get excited... I, uh, my mouth and my brain don't work together. But I, I found this clearing about two miles up the mountain. And what I did there in the clearing, two miles up 
the mountain. I did a rain dance. I did a rain dance. We've had this drought for so long. I took it upon myself to do something proactive. I did a rain dance. It was, uh, <laughs> well, it was rhythms of improvisational uh, mediocrity, I admit that, a graceless swing and sway, sending out an SOS to the weather divinities. And uh, so far, nothing. But, you know, I, I know a few gods that are crazy enough to pay attention to me. Hmm. Oh, by the way, I did get a reaction from a certain woodland audience about that, yeah. The ghosts of the Mohicans grunted and turned their backs on me. Now, I'm here wondering, um, let me just step out for one second here and ask a question to my guy. How much time do I have left? Man in the booth? Five minutes. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, oh, oh, look, here comes Rose Ivansko's husband. Yeah. And today, Rose Ivansko's husband is carrying a bucket and a scrub brush. Now, this is happening, as I'm telling you this, this is happening in the Pittsfield Cemetery. Ever been there? Yeah, it's a big, acres and acres of a nice place, nice, tranquil place to go and walk. You know, don't cause any trouble, and, and it's really tranquil there. But here comes Rose Ivansko's husband, Bucket, Scrub Grush. And what he does is, I've never seen anything this crazy in my life. He dips the scrub brush into the bucket of soapy water. And then he begins scrubbing right there among the gravestones in the Pittsfield Cemetery. Specifically, he's washing the headstone of his beloved, deceased wife, Rose Ivansko born 1971, died 2019, okay. He is a middle-aged widower, and he's an eternal coward. Rose Ivansko's husband finishes scrubbing his dead wife's tombstone, scrub brush soapy water, and he steps back, and he says, to her gravestone. Don't be mad at me, Rosie. I, I know you're mad. But I had to sell the house. You see, because they fired me over at the church. No, I, I ain't any kind of a pervert, and, and nobody's accusing me of being a thief or nothing. I always did my job over there at the church, uh, did my job good, kept the church swept and swabbed and vacuumed and dusted seven days a week, always on call, day or night. They called me Mr. Fix-It, and I had my own set of tools. But the pastor kicked me out. I fell asleep in the sacristy one night, and I left the front door of the church wide open, and the church got vandalized. Okay, I had a little too much to drink, and I'm sorry about that. And yeah, this wasn't the first time. But, but Rosie, now I can't work. And I got desperate for money. And I went and sold our house. 
So you're mad at me now, right? I know, but Rose Ivansko's husband. Rose Ivansko's husband. You see, he believes that death is no obstacle for he and his dead wife as soulmates. He trusts that their kindred spirits will stay united until the end of time. But the bedrock of his devotion is fear. Fear. And dead or alive, it's been fear that keeps him perpetually close to Rose Ivansko. Rose Ivansko's husband dips his scrub brush into the bucket of soapy water again, and uh, he checks for any spots he might have missed on the tombstone. Then it's time to leave and let nature take its course. I don't know if you follow wrestling, but back in the days of wrestling, there was a wrestler by the name of Killer Kowalski. His real name was Edward Spolnik. A Killer Kowalski uh, was born in 1926. He was a professional wrestler, the villain type of wrestler that you see, who gleefully delighted in maiming his opponents. Killer Kowalski had his famous claw hold. He had this huge hand that he used as a claw while he was wrestling to grab his opponent's stomach and squeeze them into submission. Also, Killer Kowalski was the only vegetarian wrestler. Yeah, and he said the hardest part about a vegetarian diet was catching them. And uh, a minute or two left, uh, Mr. Uh, man in the, uh, in the booth. Uh, the man in the booth will tell me momentarily, what is it? Out of time? One minute. Oh, one minute. Okay. So that's a a as much as I uh, have for today. Um, it's, uh, oh, this just in. A 14-year-old girl named Carolina Cruz set a world record by putting on 22 socks on her foot in 30 seconds. The socks were made by the Puma company. And Carolina says, I also wear Puma sneakers and Puma shirts, but never Puma pants. Herman Scuttle, so long until next time.